Okay, we're rolling. Today's video is about Brunel's greatest adversary. Adversary. Today's video is about Brunel's greatest adversary, Dionysus Lardner. Okay, so Brunel, what are the UK's or the world's greatest Brunel? But Brunel. Yeah, Isabard Kingdom Brunel. One of the greatest. Mm -hmm. um, atmospheric where are we? Okay, so the uh, aside the atmospheric railway, Brunel, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. What the, are the, UK the, the guy who didn't want to employ people who could read and write as drivers because they were thinking men. Okay, so he had a few personality failings, maybe as well. Are you gonna let me get on with this? Yep, carry on. Yeah, that's right. Carry on. Carry on. <laughs> Broad gauge. Right, get out. <laughs> Some twelve years before Brunel was born. This chap, Dionysus Lardner, was born in Dublin. He was an extremely well-respected scientist and he held the position of Professor of Natural Philosophy and Astronomy at the University College London. He played a huge part in popularising science, a huge movement that perhaps still continues today, making science so much more tangible for the likes of me and you. So exactly how did this well-educated, uh, well-rounded chap become so entangled in uh, discussions and perhaps heated debates with Brunel? Let's find out in today's video. In 1833, we first see Lardner come to blows with Brunel. During the 1830s, Brunel was busy making plans for the famous Great Western Route, the route that would see London connected to Bristol and then beyond to the Americas. Part of the 1835 Act was to incorporate a tunnel, and like many of its era, not only was its construction plagued by delays, water ingress and numerous issues, it also received considerable opposition. Whilst most focused on the geology, our friend Lardner suggested the gradient within the tunnel of 1 in 100 was the biggest problem. He said if the brakes on the train failed, it would be a runaway and it would reach 120 miles an hour. It would break up and it would kill everybody on board. So as you can see here, we are going to set up a practical experiment in our back garden to see if Lardner and his theory was correct. So essentially what we're trying to do is work out the terminal velocity, if you will, of a train on a track. Okay, we're done. Let the extremely technical experiment begin. Okay, so extremely scientific experiment. Experiment. Um, we've measured this to be approximately one in one hundred, so therefore represents the box tunnel. See, scientific. Yep. Right, are we ready to go? Yes. Okay. Although you said it was going to be a tunnel. Okay. I've got that. <laughs> there we go. And okay. it's a tunnel. Extremely accurate representation of box tunnel at a 1 in 100 gradient. In we've got a train. Now, I e think that's a little bit on the modern side. Hang on then. How about, how about some diesels? I mean, you know I love, them. I love <laughs> yeah. my diesels, right? Yeah, I know you love them, but still a little bit... A little bit too modern. Too modern still. Uh, okay, the Flying Scotsman. I mean, look at this. He's very impressive and very old. Not old enough. Okay. Okay. How about, you want old, right? Yep. Stevenson's rocket. I'm thinking a little bit too old. <laughs> okay, I mean, not much though. No, okay, no. right, one last effort. Gonna... I think that's as good as you're gonna get in terms of the... That's not bad. Right, right. So we need to wheel this to the top and see if it travels to a relative speed okay. of 120 miles an hour. So right. should I just wheel that up to you up there, turn it around, and then let it go. Right, let it go, Rebecca. Let it go. Maybe give it a little bit of a push. A little bit more of a push. Okay, so <laughs> case in point here is, um, this isn't much of a scientific um, experiment that would really represent um, the conditions, the weight of a train, the metal. However, some chap on Twitter, who is an exceptionally nice guy called Niles, I think that's how you pronounce it, Niles, you know who you are, um, did a 15 minute calculation of this on a proper scale. Um, now, you can check out his video here, but I'll put in a couple of little snippets now so you can see exactly what I mean. Paul also posted that he would like to be able to calculate this stuff, and I thought, hey, I'm a physicist, this is Mechanics 101. 
I should be able to do so. So get a gin tonic, paper and off we go. So if you just let the train roll and get into a steady state where it's just fighting air resistance and there's no additional push from, from anything, you end up with 50 kilometers an hour, which is something like um, 40 miles an hour, 35, something like that. So Dionysus Lardner, I'm afraid you were wrong. It wouldn't get to 120 miles an hour and it wouldn't suffocate the passengers and um, kill them all. Now, for a man that held the positions that he did, it seemed a little bit odd that he would make such glaring errors in his calculations. So the second time that Lardner and Brunel would come to blows was in 1836, just three years later. And it was on the subject of Brunel's SS Great Western. Now, the journey between the UK and New York was 3,500 miles. Lardner suggested at a meeting for the British Association of the Advancement of Science that his ship would only make 2,080 miles. His theory was based on calculations of ships already in service and their capacity to carry a given amount of coal. Lardner took the assumption that as you increase the size of the ship, you increase the water resistance by the same, and therefore the ship would only travel a certain distance, however big the ship was. Brunel once again pointed out the error in Lardner's mass. He suggested that the water resistance is squared, but the carrying capacity is actually cubed. So the SS Great Western made the first sail with just 200 tonnes to spare. So the third and final encounter saw Brunel and Lardner discussing railway gauges. So we all know that Brunel chose his seven foot or seven foot and a quarter inch um, gauge, um, but others around him were now going very much for the standard gauge, the Stevenson gauge of um, four foot and eight inches. So perhaps Lardner saw this as a potential cheap shot at Brunel. Yeah, so maybe he, whilst he saw that others around um, Brunel were taking the standard gauge route, he thought that this discussion of the broad gauge and its inefficiency or its um, carrying capacity would be a perfect opportunity to make his third and final attempt at bringing down the reputation of Brunel. So Lardner set out trying to prove Brunel's gauge wrong. He even used his own engine, the North Star, to do the tests. So Lardner concluded that although the North Star could carry up to 80 tonnes at 33 miles an hour, when you increase the speed to 41 miles an hour, he concluded that you could only carry 16 tonnes. This was on account of the, um, the broader gauge, he said, and therefore the greater air resistance, the wind resistance, or the, the air resistance against the front of the train. Um, that was his calculation, down to 16 tonnes from 80 tonnes with just an increase of eight miles an hour. Brunel and his colleague panicked because this was actually done with his own train, so his whole job was on the line. Indeed, his job and his career was on the line. But they concluded that if they make an alteration to the blast pipe, this would dramatically increase the efficiency of the train. And it did, bizarrely. Lardner, once again, had been uh, quashed. So Lardner wanted it both ways. Number one, he said the trains would run out of control and crash. Yep. But number two, he then said that actually they wouldn't get that fast. Absolutely, a massive contradiction, which is very strange. Why he chose Brunel to have a pop at three times because um, Lardner had at the time massively gave loads of lectures on Babbage in his in his machinery and works. Um, Babbage was good friends with Brunel, and at this big hearing, Babbage actually sided with Brunel against Lardner. Um, soon after this, Lardner went on um, and had a very famous affair, um, which, although it was common at the time, um, this was massively publicised because of his um, stance in the, in the public eye, and he took up a lot of work in, Amer in the Americas. So despite all of this, Lardner still wrote a book called Railways at Home and Abroad. Yeah, now this book was hugely important, but perhaps like in today's political climate, if you make a mistake, you're pretty much remembered for that mistake. And in this example of Lardner, he made three big mistakes up against Brunel, the man with a big personality. So the book he wrote in 1846, Railways at Home and Abroad, was a hugely important book um, in its time because it warned against the um, railway mania. It was, it was 1846, so it was at the peak of railway mania. And had people um, read his book and heeded his advice, they would have probably saved a heck of a lot of money because he warned against the, the bubble, the Railway mania bubble um, 
massive amount of detail in there, but nobody really took any notice of it. And perhaps, perhaps he made a minor change, but um, he could have saved a lot of people a lot of money. Um, but yeah, it wasn't really um, considered worthy reading because of the man that he had become yep. um, after his railway uh, reputation was sort of in shatters. So that is um, today's video. That is Brunel's greatest adversary. <laughs> I, think so. I think so. Um, yeah. <laughs> back next week with another railway tale.